Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our May 2023 edition of Talking Water with Tualatin Valley Water District. My name is Justin Dyke, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's presentation with our guest speaker. Next slide, please, Cal. All right, so we'll do a quick overview of the uh, virtual uh, tools and tricks here for using Microsoft Teams. As a reminder, all of these sessions are recorded and with any luck of good technology by this afternoon, this will be uploaded to our TVWD YouTube page for anyone who wants to watch the presentation and get any other additional information from it later on. Please make sure your microphone is muted and a couple tips to interact with the presentation today. You can always raise your hand to ask questions by using the um, hovering over the reactions button on the top bar of your screen and seeing the uh, palm facing raising hand, or you can use the chat function just to the left of that to type in your questions at any time. We will have a, a section of Q&A at the end of the presentation as well, where we can ask questions directly to our, our guest host, Cal and he can answer in real time. And as well, um, TVWD staff will wait to unmute anyone who wants to raise their hand to answer or ask a question. And then once finished, we will mute your microphone again. And we do operate in an inclusive and a discrimination-free manner to serve all of our customers. So please uh, be mindful of that. We may exclude participants who uh, use vulgar language or are disruptive to any presentations. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our senior water quality specialist, Khalil Howell. Cal comes uh, to us from in September of 2020 and brings a decade of experience as a regional trainer, providing training and operator certifications for cross control, cross connection control, I should say, backflow assembly testing and other aspects of water system operations. Cal has traveled uh, to water systems across the West Coast and Alaska and Hawaii to help develop cross connection and uh, cross connection control and inspection programs. On a personal note, Cal and his wife Hillary had their first child, a son, in last August. And in his spare time, he enjoys hike, his family hiking and reading. Cal, take it away, my friend. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Justin. And welcome to everybody who, who's joining us. I'm glad that you're able to attend today's discussion. Um, normally, I would have a sidekick with me, uh, Steve Carper, who's our conservation uh, technician, but he recently had um, his second child, and so I'll be um, taking over this uh, presentation. And basically, the the presentation it's uh, we're here to just help you begin your irrigation preparation efforts. Uh, and we've put together some slides to help guide you through a springtime automatic sprinkler system prep and tune up process. Not all sprinkler systems are the same, so there is a possibility. Yours may have unique aspects and and uh, steps captured, sorry, and some steps that aren't captured in today's presentation. So please do make sure you ask your questions at the end so we can address uh, any unique setups like that. Okay, so to get started, you'll just need some basic tools to get the job done. There are a few specialty tools that. Uh, can be helpful, but even those are pretty easy to track down at a hardware or landscape store. A large screwdriver will be helpful for opening different types of valve boxes and valve cans that may house your backflow assembly, your irrigation solenoid valves, and possibly some drain valves. A small flathead screwdriver will be handy for when we cover later on this presentation, closing some valves on your backflow assembly. Uh, there is a specialty tool designed for adjusting sprinkler heads um, that would be specific to uh, the types of sprinkler heads you may have. Um, a hand spade or a shovel will be helpful for some work. A valve key, another specialty tool that we'll cover later on to operate certain types of valves. And then, of course, gloves protecting your hands, a flashlight, depending upon um, where your assembly or solenoid valves may be, and then making sure you protect your knee. So uh, kneeling pads are, are very handy for doing this. So the first thing to locate is going to be your drain valve. So you want to 
uh, locate these manual drains and it's likely that they were left off from last year's winterization procedures. And so often you'll find the drain valves near the solenoid valves um, or the backflow assembly or sometimes at another low point in your sprinkler system. Uh, this picture here on the left, you'll see a solenoid, the, the solenoid valves and then the drain valve next to those. However, on the right, you'll see uh, probably a little bit more realistic because there's some dirt covering everything, um, a drain valve there, which in this case is by the backflow assembly. OK, so some of the drain valves will have threaded drain caps on the side of the valve, like these ones here. They may have been removed completely or just loosened during your winterization process. So make sure you replace those um, or uh, tighten them up if they've only been loosened. Uh, if not, you'll get some water shooting out the sides of those valves. So here's some common types of drain valves. On the left is a ball valve. This one in the picture is shown open since the handles, since the handle is in line with the valve. To close, the handle must be quarter turned so, so it's perpendicular to the valve. Next is the hose spigot type valve. It operates just like the ones on the side of your home, which is counterclockwise to open, clockwise to close. The third valve with that X shape on top, it requires a valve key tool to operate it easily. Similar in operation to a hose bib style, However, using the, the tool rather than your bare hand to open and close it. The last picture is that valve key. Uh, there's, it's a two pronged end which fits over the top of the X of that valve, allowing you to operate in either direction. Pliers or channel locks can be used for operating those, but you'll want to be very careful um, because it can cause damage over time. So, Keep in mind that not all irrigation systems have these manual drains, in which case the backflow assembly may have been used to drain the piping last season. Now that the drains are closed, let's move on to pressurizing the backflow assembly and the system. Okay. So there's up to five different types of backflow preventers which can be installed on the irrigation system. However, in Oregon and specifically here in the district, these are the most common types. On the left is a double check valve assembly. This type is what's installed on probably over 95% of irrigation systems here in the district. The middle is a pressure vacuum breaker assembly. And then on the right is an atmospheric vacuum breaker. All backflow preventers, no matter the type, they're designed to accomplish the same primary purpose, which is to protect your drinking water and the community's drinking water from contamination within your sprinkler system's piping. The preventer is installed typically at the point where your irrigation system piping connects to your home's plumbing system. The double check is usually installed in the ground prior to your solenoid valves housed in a rectangular plastic irrigation box with a green access lid. The pressure vacuum breaker is also prior to the zones, but it's always above grade, as you can see in that middle picture there. It must be actually 12 inches minimum above all the downstream piping, in this case, your sprinkler system piping. The atmospheric vacuum breaker, similar to the pressure vacuum breaker in that it's going to be above grade. However, each irrigation zone will have its own vacuum breaker installed after the solenoids. This results in having multiple atmospheric vacuum breakers on your irrigation system, as you can see in the picture on the right. Um, all of those are different zones, therefore equipped with its own atmospheric vacuum breaker. OK. So the double check and the pressure vacuum breaker 
They require annual testing by a state certified tester. The atmospheric vacuum breaker does not require annual testing, but it does need to be visually inspected upon installation if it's moved or if any of the irrigation piping is changed. If you have AVBs and are concerned about the installation, please email me and we can work out a time for someone to, to come and stop by. On the next slide, I'll show you the basic operation of the shutoff valves and the test ports on the double check to begin pressurizing your irrigation system. The double check has two shutoff valves and four test ports. On this slide, the shutoff valves are the green handled valves and the test ports have the black caps and the flathead screwdriver slots. On the left is the test port operation. If the slot is perpendicular to the port, it's closed. If the slot is in line with the port, it's opened. On the right is the shutoff valve operation. And similarly, um, if the handle is perpendicular to the valve, it's closed. If it's in line with the valve, it's opened. If your irrigation system has not yet been pressurized, your assembly's valves could be in a variation of opened, closed, sometimes right in between, um, something resembling the picture in the middle. The next few slides, I'll show you the proper order to pressurize your backflow assembly without soaking yourself down. Okay, so if your sprinkler system has an isolation valve, it may be in the same box as your backflow assembly or in a cylinder, what we call a valve can, near your backflow assembly box, like the picture on the left. The middle picture reflects the depth of one valve can. However, your valve could be at the bottom of several of these stacked on top of one another in the ground. The valve you see on the right with a question mark was the depth, um, was the depth of my whole arm, and I discovered a gate valve submerged under the water. So if you open your valve can, you might um, not know until you reach down in there. So clear out cobwebs, spiders, those types of things. Isolation valves are typically gate or ball valves, similar if not identical to some of the drain valves we had discussed earlier. Before opening the isolation valve, you'll need to address your assembly's valve positions. Okay, so in many years uh, of, of my testing, um, I've accidentally flushed contacts off my eyeballs, soaked my shirt, and caused neighbors to think I've broken something, when in reality, it was just water pressure from one of these ports. So here is a step-by-step -step process to prevent that from happening to you. Step one and two is just closing all four of the test ports and both of those shutoff valves as illustrated in the picture on the left. Step three, if you have an isolation valve, like we just discussed, we want to open that to introduce water pressure up to the backflow assembly. If you don't have that isolation valve, you can omit this step. And it's likely that the valve on your backflow assembly itself was or has been used to isolate the irrigation system. Step four, we're going to open the number one shutoff valve to introduce pressure into the backflow assembly. So at this point, we'll want to confirm there's no leaks from your isolation valve up to the backflow assembly and also on the backflow assembly. Then lastly, we're going to open the number two shutoff valve very slowly. This introduces pressure to your irrigation solenoid valves. If you open it too quickly, you can damage your irrigation system with water hammer. Confirm you have no leaks between the assembly and the solenoid valves at, at this point. At this point, you've just successfully pressurized your irrigation system. Let's move on to the assembly testing requirements now.
District and state rules require all backflow assemblies to be tested annually by a state certified tester to confirm prop operation. Residential testing is due before September 1st each year, which you've probably already see, received a few reminder letters for already. As a district customer, there are a few ways to accomplish this test. You can hire your own state certified tester or subscribe to TVWD's Gold Plain Annual Testing Program. If you'd like to hire your own tester, that is totally okay. There are many companies that provide testing services within the district boundaries. There is also a state website uh, that we can post, which provide a public list of testers. However, ask around. Your neighbors may have recommendations or your landscape company may have a certified tester as well. The district's goal plan program is an optional testing service available for most of our residential customers, which currently over half of our customers are subscribed to. The goal plan subscription is $35 per backflow assembly added once annually to your water bill. So to be clear, this is a recurring cost added just one time per year. Once subscribed to Walton Valley Water District, we will arrange your backflow assembly test through our contracted certified backflow testers. To subscribe, you can go to our website to submit a digital application through our web portal. It's really fast and easy. We'll send you a confirmation. Um, and we are at this point, we have many applications from our recent uh, our recent letters that have gone out and we're working through those. If you've not received a response yet, um, we are, uh, we'll be getting to that shortly. The cutoff date to be included in this year's testing is May 31st. So please subscribe before then if you are interested. Okay, so back to irrigation preparation process. This here is just a good general overview of a sprinkler system layout. It's like it's likely more complex than many systems, but it gives you a good idea of where the different components of the sprinkler system are located. So if you are viewing on a screen, I'm going to throw my laser pointer up here just to cover some high level points, um, starting out here to the bottom left by the water meter. So on the left hand side of the meter, that's actually coming from the distribution system. That then flows through the meter to your private plumbing. And then from there, it continues on to serve the home. However, if you have an irrigation system, it's typically, not all the time, but typically teed off somewhere between the meter and your home in the landscape. So it tees off to where if you have an isolation valve, that would be installed at that point. Then to the backflow preventer, because it needs to isolate the entirety of the plumbing of the irrigation system. This assembly here is an above grade installation of an assembly that's actually not really common for underground sprinkler systems uh, here in Oregon. So yours would likely be down here in line in an in-ground valve box. Um, after that, you may or may not find a reduced, uh, a pressure reducing valve. And then downstream of that is where you're going to have a variation of additional. Um, sorry, you, you could have a, a main solenoid valve, additional isolation valves, as you can see here, and then your different zones which serve. Um, depending upon the complexity of your system, you can serve some drip irrigation, you can serve just standard lawn irrigation maybe a zone that goes to sprinkle just a specific set of plants that you want on a unique um, time set and schedule. Uh, and this is uh, just that general overview of a sprinkler system. Here's a, a link to a YouTube video, and we can drop this in the chat, but of course, uh, if you get this PowerPoint presentation after this, you can just go ahead and click that link. Um, and it just provides some basic tips to maintain your sprinkler system and optimize its efficiency. It actually stars our district's one and only uh, Steve Carper, the conservation technician I had mentioned earlier. He's in this video. Uh, 
Okay. So here's the brain of your irrigation system. The controller programs your start times, your zones, and your irrigation duration. Your controller is likely in the off position from last year's winterization procedures. Whether it's an indoor or outdoor mounted controller, I'd like to just cover some general guidance, but keep in mind controller units can have unique function and different button, dial, or touchscreen layouts. I recommend reviewing the quick start guides, which is generally located on the inside of the controller door or the controller panel. Also reading your user manual. If you can't find yours, you can likely download it online. That's probably the most important thing is getting familiar with your controller. Although many of them are um, very similar in operation, um, getting familiar with how your system works is gonna be the most beneficial thing. So to start, we just wanna turn a dial typically from that off position into the on or the run position. And depending upon your programming from last year, you may not need to make any adjustments to the start times or watering durations. But this is a good time to go through your programming to make sure things are set properly. If you have extra programs set, um, often that's done unintentionally. And then what happens is you have sprinklers going off at times um, you don't actually want them to. Also, having extra start times that if that's done again unintentionally, you'll have the same outcome. Um, and then, depending upon how much time you have, doing some troubleshooting of making sure you are adjusting your times for your different zones based upon the type of sprinkler heads you have, based upon the type of plants that you're watering. Um, and then keep in mind, just looking for runoff and things like this to where you may need to shorten the time frame of a specific zone or increase of another zone. So these are some things that you can fine tune um, by just spending some time um, with your controller and seeing how it affects your different zones. So from the controller, you want to actually run the entire sprinkler system, but one zone at a time. And then as you do this, you want to, for that specific zone, as you're alternating between them, you want to check for signs of leakage from damaged sprinkler heads or broken piping, clean clogged nozzles, filters, or sprinkler heads, and then check for accuracy in your spray patterns and adjust your sprinklers so that the that you, of course, you're watering what you're intended to and not the sidewalk or pavement. And this is uh, another need of a specialty tool for certain types of sprinkler heads to adjust the radius and arc pattern of those sprinkler heads. Another thing to, to look for is adjusting the sprinklers that may have sunken down um, or have become misaligned and ensure that the spray isn't blocked by plants or other obstructions. Okay. And one thing, uh, let me back up real quick. One thing as um, you're pressurizing your sprinkler system, um, and we maybe we can go into more detail during the Q&A, but as the, uh, if you're at a time where there should be no flow to your sprinkler system, so all your solenoid valves are closed, you're not running even any water in your home, doing a leak detection test is something you could do on your own by looking at your water meter. And there's a little often a, a, a triangle or an arrow that will spin according to the flow rate. So if you stare at that thing long enough or even put something there on the on the 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 meter and then come back and look at it and you see any movement in that that means there's water going into your plumbing system and so this can be uh this can be assistance in determining if you have any leaks in your sprinkler system if it's not obvious enough from um, emerging water okay so now moving on 
For weather stations and rain sensors, there's actually very little preparation required for these types of sensors. Just remove any covers placed for the winter, inspect for damages, and remove any tree or bird debris that may have accumulated during the off season. Okay, and then lastly, don't worry, I'm not gonna read this one to you. This is just a maintenance checklist that summarizes a lot of the steps we've captured today. If you like this list, um, like I've said before, this whole presentation is available for, for download so you can go through it. However, um, you can also email me and I can send you just this list uh, specifically. And so actually with that, it, it about wraps us up. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Justin so we can hear from you. Thanks, Cal. So we got our first question in the chat. The customer writes in, why do we have both an isolation valve and a number one shutoff valve? Cal, this question came in earlier in the presentation, so I might have to go back a little bit in your memory there. But um, yeah, again, yeah. why do we have an isolation valve and a number one shutoff valve? Yeah, so great question. Um, let me actually get back there real quick, but ultimately there could be a time where even your backflow assembly may need replacement. And so that, that isolation valve would allow you to isolate just the irrigation system to remove that backflow assembly rather than shutting off um, the meter uh, and where it, you'd lose water the whole home for that process. So this valve would allow for replacing the, the backflow assembly if needed. But then also for winterization, for winterization, um, if you're using, and I have my laser pointer up, I hope you can see, I'm circling right now the number one shutoff valve. And it's ideal to actually, when you winterize, have that at the angle that it is in this picture, at a 45 degree angle. And the reason is if you close it completely, if the temperatures dropped low enough, um, the internal anatomy of a, of a ball valve, um, it basically closes uh, a hollow um, globe, basically, and it traps a volume of water in the ball valve. And so it, if it's closed completely and that water freezes, it can split the brass of the backflow assembly. And um, so that would be, uh, by, by having an isolation valve, it would allow you to leave all of these valves on the assembly at that 45 degree angle, rather than closing the number one completely. And just to emphasize, that's only if the temperatures really got down low enough. Um, it's not that that's for sure gonna happen to you um, every winter. It's just a potential scenario. Awesome. Thanks, Cal. Um, our next question is going to come from Albert, who has his hand raised, and I'm trying to unmute right now. But Albert, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, so originally I just raised my hand um, because I saw the um, the question come up and I wanted to, I didn't know if that was getting seen or not in the chat, but since um but I still do have a question. Will there be a separate one of these to talk about winterizing uh, of like a session like this um, later? Like before the winter? Or is it or is this it where you just explained about putting those things at the 45 degree and no, so we we can absolutely do a, a separate talking water for um, in the fall for winterizing. We've done one in the past and we'd um, if you're interested in that content, I know we can repeat that. Um, Cal, you want to say anything else? Um, no, j just to reiterate what you said, um, we've put it on before and I'd, I'd be happy to put it, put it on again. Yeah. And so, so I'll jump, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll yeah. jump in here real quick. My name is Frank Reed. I'm the communications coordinator and I help, uh, set these up and yeah, we would de well, definitely put it on the list to do one. Uh, in general, our winter one is more about like emergency preparedness and that type of thing, but I'll definitely work with Cal and possibly with Steve and add, uh, ir um, uh, winterizing your backflow system as well. So that's a great idea. Thank you for it very much. Okay. And then uh, did I understand correctly earlier? You said 
I thought I heard you say that most do not have the isolation valve because I I feel like I don't from the last time I looked, but I'd have to check again. Is this something that oh. is common or, or less common? Great question. Uh, so I, I don't believe I said most don't. Um, it, it's it's kind of a throw up to be honest. Some some do, some don't. Um, so I would say the majority, if not all, of new systems um, do always have one, but older systems sometimes would would lack. So I don't have like a percentage to 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 give you, but um, it's it's a it's a mix between the two. And if um, I if I didn't have one, do I understand correctly that in, that in the winter I should I can't do this forty five degree thing. I have to do the full shut off on that shut off valve number one. Is that so? Yeah, great question. The you would be able to uh, winterize it mostly the same. However, if you're looking at the picture again, I'll show you um, what you would be able to do. So let me let me back up. There would be two valves that you couldn't necessarily winterize the same way you could with an isolation valve, which would be this number one shutoff valve would have to be closed completely at that uh, perpendicular position. So that wouldn't be winterized the same. And then this this number one port here. That is on the pressure side of the valve. So that would have to be closed or you'd have continuous pressure flowing out of that first test port. However, the rest of the assembly, so the test port two, three, four, and then the number two shutoff valve could be, sorry about my awful line there. Um, the, those could be left at the 45 degree angle. So in short, you could winterize it mostly the same other than these beginning two valves. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. So is there a contact person like if I have because I don't want to keep asking lots of questions here and, and for everyone else. Is there someone is there like a good email address if I had questions down the down the line? Yeah, you could. Um, so let me give you our uh, a general uh, backflow related email. So we have backflow at TVWD dot okay. org. And there's okay. there's a, a, a small handful of us that monitor that. So I, I it could very well be me that replies to you. Um, but rather than going directly to my inbox, as I am in the field often. Um, so somebody can get back to you quicker if I'm not available to, to get back to you. OK, thank you. And I'm kind of a backflow geek, so I'm I'm so happy to, to answer any questions you have. And so Frank just put uh, that email address and our conservation at tvwd.org email addresses in the chat. So and, um, Albert and everyone else joining us this afternoon, please feel free to use those. Like Cal said, those are monitored um, by a couple different folks so we can make sure that if for some strange reason Cal's on vacation, uh, should we ever allow him to do that? Uh, your questions will get answered. And we do have another question in the chat for you, Cal. Uh, this is from Wayne. It says, how do you calculate the water rate of a drip irrigation system? I have half inch netafram. Mm, that's a hard one. Netafram tubing buried under mulch. You know, to answer that properly, I think we'd have to save that one for Steve Carper. We can absolutely yeah, I'm that. sorry. I'm sorry, Wayne. I wish I had a, a, an answer for you. Steve Carper, he would. Um, he may have a, a, a detailed answer for you on that. So Wayne, if, if it's not too much, if you could uh, maybe copy and paste that question into the conservation um, email address that's in the chat, we'll make sure we get you an answer here uh, as quick as we can. We just don't have that um, subject matter expert available today, um, but it is a great question because um, we wanna make sure you're using that water as efficiently as possible um, through your drip irrigation system. And it looks like. Thanks, wonderful, Wayne. So it looks like um, that is the last question we have as of right now. So I'll give it a last call for questions. Um, if anyone wants to write any into the chat while we're still here. Otherwise, if you'd like to ask it directly of Cal, you can um, hit that raise hand button and we can call on you. Yeah, don't be shy. If you have a question, I'd definitely love to hear from you. And it looks like we are 
out of questions right now. We've got a couple of things going on in the chat about um, the drip spacing and uh, manufacturer specs for the gallons per minute. So it sounds like there's some expertise maybe in the audience, which is really great. But as of now, Cal, we are out of questions. So um, thanks again to everyone who took the time out of their day today to join us and learn about tuning up their irrigation systems and getting everything ready for this nice weather. Hopefully um, we get a little bit more of a nice gentle spring instead of these rapid ascents into the 90s that we've gotten already this year. I know it's been a little much for me uh, personally, but uh, we look forward to a really great spring and summer season here around the district. And again, this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube here shortly this afternoon, so you can watch it at your leisure and take the expertise as you go out into um, your front and your backyard and get your irrigation systems tuned up. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us uh, for Talking Water, and we hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you.